welcome to the Green Pill Weekly. I'm Katie. And I'm Andy. We're a couple growers from Montana. And we, uh, our journey's been pretty long as yes. far as <laughs> we've done tomatoes, aquaponics, microgreens. I do a lot of tree propagating and trees from seed now, uh, tropical trees and plants, house plants. Chasing around critters. Yep, we have some chickens, cows, goats, and we're going to kind of show you how our operation has evolved, is continuing to evolve, and how all those things work together. Yeah. Probably do quite a few tutorials. Go back into some of the art well, archives. Yeah, yeah, go into the bootstrap archives and pull out some interviews and, and concepts that, you know, still apply, maybe even apply more uh, not in our day to day lives. Absolutely. We get to meet up with some of the brightest people in the industry, sharing their journey along with urban gardening, along with homesteading. We've got just a lot in store for you guys. And the bootstrap farmer team. Pretty much all of us have our hands in some gardening and projects that I think you're all going to be interested in. Uh, we're all very impassioned about gardening and growing and just, you know, making things better. And we absolutely make a ton of mistakes along the way. Um, we'll be along for some of those mistakes. Absolutely. And I am some not of qualified. the success, too. <laughs> we're not necessarily qualified to be doing anything. No. But that doesn't mean we won't give it a try. Yep. Um, I'm going to definitely take you in um, to the kitchen for some of this, too, and some of the preservation methods we like to use. And we might tinker around in the shop a little bit. I like it. Tune in. Thanks. Today on Egg History, we're going to talk about the origins of greenhouses. Um, around 30 AD, Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, had a physician that told him he needed to eat a cucumber every day to maintain his health. Now, in our modern times, we would probably consider these cucumbers more of a melon, a, a small melon, and they lack the sweetness of a modern day melon. Now back to these Roman cucumbers, they were growing them in large wooden carts, and they take these carts out on sunny, nice days, and then at night, and, and on a cloudy, say a cold day, or in the off season, they'd wheel them into these sheds that were covered with panels of selenite. Now, selenite is a crystallized form of gypsum. It's transparent, it's about as clear as glass. In 30 AD, people didn't have glass sheets yet. They didn't have that technology. They're, it was all blown glass. They had beads, vases, things of that nature, um, you know, bulbs or whatever, whatever you blow out of glass. Um, now, these crystals could only be cut up um, probably about a foot by a foot, you get a square foot panel. Uh, so Tiberius, his, his greenhouse was hundreds of these little panels. And that's how he got his, you know, his cucumbers that he needed every single day. It was kind of classic Roman fashion. I want it, I need it, I'm gonna have it. Uh, now these greenhouses, we're talking 30 AD, it's kind of the beginning of living inside and manners and you know, the. We, we come up with windows, what's the first thing we do? We build a greenhouse for cucumbers. And you know, I'm, I, I would say it's probably 1800, almost 2000 years uh, until greenhouses kind of become an actual production model, something that uh, your, your more average person could have in their home or in their yard, or that would actually be feasible for feeding a population of people. At this time, we were talking about, you know, um, the pleasantries of life. The Romans really liked to have those extra little niceties. And yeah, I mean, for almost 2000 years, this is people showing off their wealth. They're, look what I can do in spite of nature. Um, look what I have that you can't. And you know, it's, uh, it's a really long road to the greenhouse as we think of it. But the first greenhouses started showing up around 30 AD in the Roman Empire. Hey guys, long time no see. I just took, it's the first nice day here in a while that it's like comfortable to be outside. So I thought I would just take a walk and do one last walkthrough of the before garden before we start the renovation, redo, reconfiguration, whatever you want to call it this weekend. Gabby, thought we were going to have a special guest. Uh, so yeah, the new bed came in. It's like halfway put together. I have to shovel all of the dirt that is in the pre-existing beds out so we can move the beds put the new one in and start filling it with dirt now 
I had the revelation the other day that I just bought a hundred cubic foot bed and I have to actually fill it. So not only do I have to pay for the new bed, I have to pay to put soil in it. So I've been scouting and looking around and finding different ways to kind of offset some of that cost. Now I'll talk about some resources that I've uncovered um, in the next video. So make sure you come back. But uh, the first thing that I did was I kind of looked around my house. I was like, what can I use to fill this bed? Like, I, obviously, I'm not going to shove a little dirt out of the ground and into that bed. So what can I use to kind of offset some of this, you know, this cost of having to buy dirt? And this bed is actually half a foot taller than my old beds. So some of my old beds are only like 10 inches deep. Uh, yeah, 10 inches, I think, at the most. Nothing is even a foot deep. This is a foot and a half deep. So it just that extra depth is extra soil. And I don't really need a, a foot and a half deep bed. I'm not planting any, you know, tomatoes or anything that's going to root really deep in there. My root crops are going to fit in there just fine. I'm just growing little turnips and radishes. The depth is just not super necessary for what I'm doing right now. It might be later. And, you know, that's what made this such a great investment. But as of now, I don't really need a foot and a half. So I looked around the house and because we've been in the house for the last like nine months, we have boxes everywhere. Our garbage people hate us because our recycling is just always full. So we just keep them in the house. And now my house looks like a giant like child's fort. It's insane. So they're stacked really high in my house. And I was like, I can use this to fill up my bed. Hello. So, you know, obviously I don't have a lot, but it's the holidays right now, so we're still getting a lot of packages in the mail. Booster. So it's the holidays right now. We're buying things. They're getting shipped to the house. We have all these extra boxes, big and small. It doesn't need to be all large boxes. We have tons of little ones, and you just break them down, and you can lay them inside your garden bed to act as mulch. But if you layer it a few feet, or excuse me, a few inches deep, it'll compensate for all that extra space. So I'm going to stack mine if I, as high as I can, or as high as I need them to be, maybe like five or six inches, and then start putting the soil on top. So you have to have them, you know, stacked compactly for five or six inches. So that way, when the soil is on them, it doesn't just completely weigh it down. So just keep that in mind if you're going to, you know, use this hack or this technique. But that's my plan to do that throughout the entire inside of the new bed to kind of offset the amount of soil that I need. And it'll also act as a great mulch. It'll act as a great weed suppressor. And over time, it'll just break down. So that is one way that you'll be able to kind of offset some costs in gardening. It can be a hefty thing to, you know, start up front, but it's going to pay dividends in the end. You're growing your own food. The bed is going to last a really long time. You're only going to really need to amend the soil every season or so. So let us know if you try this. I'm so excited to actually do it myself and check back in our next video to see how it went and some other hacks and tricks that I found to help you save money in the garden. Hello, folks. My name is Nick, and today we're going to use this four-part grid to kind of help you find your place within the market and to kind of help you set your prices. And this can be done either before you start a farm business or if like right now it's been 2020, everything has changed. If you need to make uh, some changes to your business or changes to what you do, this is a good brainstorming session that doesn't cost any money that kind of helps you decide where you're going to be or what your product or service could be or who you could serve. So real quick, if we take a look at the grid, up at the very top right, you're going to have a premium service or a product. So this is going to serve uh, just a handful of clients, but it's going to have a price, a high price tag uh, associated with it. So just think of agritourism events or a single product that you uh, really put a lot of time and effort into that you can get top dollar for. Moving over to the right, you're going to have your bread and butter sales. And I like to look at this as a number that you can hit every single week uh, to dedicated clients. It does, maybe not necessarily a few, but this is every single week or every single time that you offer this product, whether that's a farmer's market or a delivery day or a CSA pickup, this is the amount that's going to carry your business it, it's not the gravy that the premium product would be, but this is good steady income that your farm can make a living out of, that you can take your employees and grow just a little bit. Now, down below that is commodity sales. Now, commodity sales is nice because you're dealing with very few clients, but you're moving a lot of volume. 
So yeah, may, you're not getting the prices that the bread and butter may attain selling direct to your uh, clients or the even better prices that you'll get having a special event or a special product or a special, uh, I don't want to use the word sale, but a, a special offering uh, to just a very few uh, amount of clients. So this is low clients, high price, low clients, lower price, but volume. And then over there to the left, you're you're going to have your passion project. And this, for our industry, it's it's semi unfortunate, but this is where a lot of farmers start. They're super into whatever brought them into farming, whether that's mycology and mushrooms, or growing in the soil, or growing hydroponically. Whatever mindset the farmer is in, this is where they start, and this is the thing that gets them going and, and excited about it. But this doesn't necessarily mean that the marketplace uh, cares about it or is um, ready for that type of service in that area. So this has very little amount of clients, uh, especially within a smaller geographic or, or region. Uh, like if you're in a big city and you're really into mushrooms, there's going to be a chance that a lot of people uh, are also in there. So you can actually get by with not a few, but you'll see here in a minute how this may actually turn into a premium uh, service. Uh, this could also be something like, look, I want to make a change in my community. I'm okay if this passion project is a part of my business. I'm okay if this actually costs our business a little bit. But let's take this bucket and let's segment it away from everything else. And let's figure out a way for these premium services, the bread and butter, the commodity to actually pay for that. Let's not base our business on hey, we're going to donate 10% of everything we sell back to whatever organization or whatever means, unless that is sustainable uh, for the long haul. So let's get into it. We're going to push the passion project off to the side for right now, and let's focus on what most people try to get into right off the bat within farming. So bread and butter, this is direct to consumer uh, sales either from the farmer's market or a CSA drop-off or pickup or a special delivery day. And then you also have commodity goods, which would be selling directly to chefs or selling uh, in a co-op marketplace or something like that, where somebody is actually taking your goods, giving you one price and selling it for something else to somebody else. Now, you'll notice on the lines, I have these uh, little infinity symbols. And to me, that represents an opportunity to kind of blend both. It's okay to have a commodity business and actually get a higher premium than somebody else in your area that is also selling commodity, but is trying to push more volume. My best example of this is Ryan Pierce in Washington, DC. Direct chef sales of specialty boutique herbs, edible flowers, uh, very petite greens. He had all kinds of stuff going on. But because he was the only one doing that, even though he was selling it as a commodity, which it was going to be resold through uh, the menu at that restaurant, we have to look at that as a premium product or service because his prices were not dictated by the chefs themselves, but he knew his inputs, he knew his costs, he knew what he had to do to make uh, a living while making uh, payroll and letting his business grow at the same time. So this premium product or service does drift in between or can drift in between if you're specializing in something. A little bit ago, we used the mushroom idea. Well, if you were super into mushrooms and you know that chefs, although they might not be into the mushrooms for the same reasons you are, that it is a premium product or service, especially if you're able to either grow something that they can't currently get or deliver it into such a way that is more convenient for them, that you're, you're catering to whoever this person is. You're not catering to your passion project, the things that motivate you. You're catering to what motivates your end user, your client. Now, if I look back a few years ago at my own businesses, I had a different line for each one of these. And I'll go through there with you. Some of you know my background, some of you don't. Uh, this whole thing comes from uh, the Minimum Agricultural Product uh, or the MAP course within Urban Farm Academy. It's a free course. We don't charge anything for it, but it's it's starting you out with zero idea, taking you all the way to launch and then what happens after the launch of your product or service or business. So uh, if you're interested in learning a lot more about this and a lot more of that process of learning 
who to serve and how to serve it, uh, take a look at urbanfarmacademy.com under the map section of the courses. Again, there's no charge for that. So my bread and butter was meals. My farm consisted of a 30 by 96 hoop house that had seasonal herbs, uh, seasonal specialty crops, and I had a 30 by 36 uh, full-on greenhouse, automated controls, that kind of thing that we just strictly did uh, cherry tomatoes in, sometimes a little bit of cucumbers. Um, and then we had a 2,400 square foot, roughly, I don't know, 24 to 3,600 holes of production, hydroponic uh, NFT situation, kind of depending on the season and how we had that room set up. But so we had indoor grow, a greenhouse and a high tunnel. Uh, we had a few like open beds here and there, but uh, not anything we really counted on except for in the summer when we were doing uh, squash, zucchini and that kind of thing. And so my farm was based off of, you couldn't buy just uh, one item from me. Everything that you got from me was processed into a meal with a commercial kitchen on the farm. And so my bread and butter was our Victory Lunch Club in which we sold a 13 salad. So my bread and butter was called Victory Lunch Club, and it was a subscription salad meal delivery service that we delivered to only offices on Wednesdays. Uh, that way they could have a meal or two from Wednesday, Thursday. And we can, we'll get into that like much later on, why all that was set up the way it was. But this was weekly income, 50 weeks out of the year that I could count on with a subscription base between 100 and 150 uh, people a week that I was consistently bringing in at minimum $13 per head. And a lot of these folks would order multiple salads, and so that only padded the bottom line while dealing with fewer people. But th this was my bread and butter. On the other hand, my also uh, bread and butter was going to the farmer's markets on Saturday where we would sell uh, not only the same salads, but we would also do like uh, bigger meals where we would have like family-style meals uh, one-off meals, appetizers, snack packs, sauces, uh, stuff like that. And then that also morphed into a mocktail food truck where we we would still do the meals, but then the food truck was specializing in herbs uh, and cocktail mixes that we would you know keg our own sodas, blending our own blended drinks. And it was just a, a way to have a lot of fun at the farmer's market. And that was being sold for $7 a, a for a 16 or 20 ounce glass. I can't remember. And so we were basically adding a second line of income at the farmer's market, but it was still bread and butter. It was just consistent. It wasn't pre-sold. Now, my commodity, even though it made up a very small percentage of my business, it was steady and consistent, and I was able to move volume uh, with only using one or two other people. So one, we sold to a bakery in town, just fresh herbs and specialty uh, things that they would pre-order like carrots for their small plates, or if they were going to do something special on, on Saturday night where they had pizza night, uh, we would work with them on that. And secondly, and the bigger one was a butcher that the same day that we would deliver these salads to, we would deliver a, a set of garden salads. Uh, sometimes it was as few as a dozen, and sometimes it was upward of 36 a week, depending on the time of year, or what was going on to this bakery, uh, not to the baker, I'm sorry, to the butcher. And so by doing the same thing here and also able to drop off volume at one spot, that's where we're starting to combine commodity, bread and butter. We were still doing the same thing. We were setting up once, harvesting once, washing, packaging, delivering all on the same day, but we were making two separate lines of income. I would take $2 less per salad from him because he would pay all up front upon delivery and it was one stop. So I was able to move a dozen to three dozen salads almost every single week. We shut down the week of Thanksgiving and the week of Christmas past New Year's for, for everything. Uh, but that was those commodity sales and the bread and butter. Now, the premium product or service is we would do brunches out of that same food truck that we use for mocktails. We would host uh, either on farm or we would set up in a pop-up location. It was based off a of free mimosa bar with French press coffee and a small plate, and most of the time crepes. We had a crepe maker on the truck. So we would sell tickets. Uh, you, only, you had to buy two tickets at a time, so it was anywhere from $35 to $45 for the pair of tickets, um, and that would get you the small plate, 
the French press coffee, um, and then the crepes for brunch. You know, the mimosas were free because we didn't have a liquor license or anything now, but we could give it away. So that was free included with the ticket. And then uh, because I didn't have to, that was like a one-off thing that we would do like once a month. Um, we basically just went to our same client list that we serviced over here at our commodity, used our email system and said, hey, we have these tickets. This is how many tickets we have. And usually we could sell out in just a few hours. We knew how many people were coming. We knew what to expect for. And we were able to either harvest or purchase what we needed without um, buying a bunch of extra stuff that was going to cost us money. That was our premium product. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it set us up for a few catering gigs here and there. But basically, this was a much higher charge for not that much more food. It was just the situation that uh, it was presented in and put in. And the good thing about selling those tickets two at a time is not many people are just going to want to go with just their spouse or their friend. They're going to invite more people. So two tickets always came into four or six or sometimes eight or more. Uh, so that's a really good way to move a lot of uh, sales onto one very condensed part of, part of the time, too. We had a couple hours of setup. We would do the event, which usually lasted for about four hours, a couple hours of cleanup. It was, it was nice. It was a good way to get a little bit of that gravy money, I like to call it, other than the bread and butter. It was a good way for that truck to pay for itself, so we had less inputs on the commodity sales. So it all started working together. Now, my passion project, a lot of people originally uh, came across me. In fact, that's how Bootstrap found me, was uh, State of the Soil. It was uh, online education before online was cool. Uh, it was about four years ago and where it cost me a ton of money to put all these things out there, these ideas, and talk to other people. It was an online conference, and it didn't generate any income, but... It was the thing I had to do. It was the, the part of me that wanted to give back to the industry. And so I let all of these other things pay for this passion project. I also have a landscape company and then a retail nursery that helped fund some of that. But I was never relying on that to make an income. Sure, I wanted, I wanted to be a little bit cost neutral, which it never was. But I was okay with it because that's what I was passionate about. That's what I dog-eared some of that for. So that's where my passion project lived. We sold to the bakery, we sold to the butcher, we sold direct to consumer, both on a delivery day, which is almost a modified CSA. And we also did the farmer's market. You know, I must say all of that was added value product and added value product only. And it was set accordingly. We Nobody else in town was even coming close to doing this. So we were able to charge what we needed to charge to make a fine living here while supporting my employees and the rest of the businesses. And then we had the premium product, which was the catering and the brunch events. So the lesson here is whenever you are thinking about applying this to your own farm and you're trying to decide where am I going to land? We, you know, a lot of people like, if you get, if you're on these Facebook groups, a lot of people are like, Hey, I'm going to grow artichokes. How much is everybody else getting a pound? And it's a mute point because if you're growing artichokes because you really care about artichokes, make sure that you're going out into your community and finding out is those artichokes, are they going to have a place to live? And if so, do people like artichokes just because and they can get it from a jar or are they, are they super passionate about artichokes and they, and they want the freshest of the fresh and they have no desire to uh, grow them themselves? Well, probably what you're going to find is that's not enough to sustain a small farm business. But a mixed crop or even some specialty crops that you know for sure that you pre-sold or you pre-validated your market and maybe to these people can have a second or third offering that they will gladly pay for because you're consistently showing up every single week and showing them that you know what you're doing, then you can charge this premium product. Or maybe you're going to have a CSA that's bread and butter, that's coming direct to sales all the time. Maybe you're going to have uh, boxes going to a chef or a storefront in which somebody else is going to make a bump off of reselling your stuff. Having these boxes helps you dictate not only your prices, but some of your process and what you're going to deliver. Hey man, if you're a passion project, 
if you can only do it on the weekends because you have a, another job or a second career, make sure that that passion process make sure that that passion process has buyers or has something you can do on the weekend whenever you can do it. It may not jive with when. Hey, these other people, they may like their weekend. They may not want to come to your farm and, and do your agritourism tour. You just don't know until you ask. So all of these boxes help you have ideas and then ask yourself, well, what if? What if we had bread and butter, but what if we also took this and worked with another farm and had an event? What if we sold the chefs, but we, we actually find that, that the chefs aren't buying enough? Maybe we can go direct to consumer and push yourself into the bread and butter. Always ask yourself, what can you combine these other industries with? What are your other skill sets? Uh, I talked to a farmer the other day. His wife was super into making tortillas, and he was super into growing. And I said, how come you guys can't combine what you're doing and actually infuse these tortillas more like a wrap? And he really liked that idea, and they're going to explore it. But by, com by combining what you're already good at with your growing, with what some of your passions are, with what there's a lot of holes in the marketplace you're going to start to find. Having a place to put those ideas down in the grid. And man, if you make a hundred of these, that's great because you could have an idea. This could just be one product. If your farm only does, I'm going to go back to that mushroom thing because it's, it's, it has the so much opportunity to do so much. My passion process is I want to teach people how to make their own mushrooms I want to sell uh, chefs oyster mushrooms and shiitakes because that's easy to grow. I can grow in volume and I know they'll take it. I also want to dehydrate mushrooms and encapsulate and do things like that that you can set up on a subscription basis or a monthly product to some people that are in town. Or maybe you have a combination of all of that where they come and learn about the mushrooms. They also get a, a grow kit that they can take for themselves and they're uh, able to harvest what you already have there on site. And you wrap that up with a chef tasting uh, where you have a chef come out and work with the farm uh, all where he gets paid and you get paid and it's all one premium service. So you kind of kind of see how after a while you start putting more and more ideas down, the more and more ideas that you get. All of that information is already in your head. This is just a way to help pull it out. So. I hope that helps. And like I said, there's a lot more on Urban Farm Academy. We talk about this matrix a lot. Uh, have a good day.